how's it going? My name is Jay and welcome to the channel. Today we're back here playing some Planet 2 in Sanikov Land. For those of you who are new here, Sanikov Land is my current build in Planet Zoo, where we're focusing on building this really large modern zoo in this lovely lush tropical environment. If that sounds good to you, do feel free to hit the subscribe button, of course, do follow on for more Sanikov Land content, and of course like the video if you did like today's video. Now with the intro out of the way, let's talk about what exactly it is we are doing today. So today we are actually going to get started on the Australian section of Sanikov Land. Or should I say more the Australasian section. Um, I'm, I'm going to include some animals from Southeast Asia as well as we go along because I didn't think we had enough animals for a purely Southeast Asian section or purely Australian section so I thought a good mix would be nice. And you know it's the same sort of region of the world, a lot of very islandy animals, you know stuff like that. So it will be a lot of fun I think to work on this section. We have been working on the African section a lot recently, but of course that will be worth taking a break from that considering we just got the Australian DLC this past week. And uh, that DLC has been absolutely amazing. I am a huge fan of it, loving the new items, absolutely loving the new animals. The cassowary is one of my favourite animals on the planet, like my second favourite bird. and. Literally, it's been in the thumbnail of the past three videos I've made, so you guys can tell how much I like it, including this one, because today we are working on the cassowary habitat, uh, which is going to be the first of our kind of Australian trail, which is going to be kind of um, a long tubular kind of, you know, walkthrough area where you're going to walk through this place and it's going to be almost like a gallery where on one side you'll be able to see the animals, but on the other side you'll be able to see showcases of Australian Aboriginal artwork and stuff like that. So because uh, the DLC did come with some really amazing uh, Aboriginal styled art pieces, which I think would be really cool to put on display in the zoo alongside the animals that they represent. So that's what we're going to be doing as well. So I think that will be quite cool and should make for a very interesting uh, area of the park. Here, of course, we're just uh, starting off by uh, increasing the size of this pathway area just to make a little bit more of a plaza. Kind of sticking with the style that we created really early on in the park with these plaster pieces, kind of creating these kind of thick lines across the path, mainly to cover up the uh, little gaps that we have there from, you know, whenever we set up a path, there's always a little bit of a gap sometimes. So these help. Uh, get rid of those gaps while also looking pretty aesthetically like uh, quite interesting and allowing us to create big plazas without having like um, you know weird gaps everywhere and of course adding in these little pillar things which I think look really cool. Uh, they are actually signs in the game like uh, you know signs where you can put letters and stuff on them but uh, here I decided to just use them as decorative elements. Here we're going to start uh, working on the path that's going to be leading us through this Austra Australasian section and uh, I'm using one of the new paths. I really like this new path. This, um, what's it called? I can't remember what exactly it's called, like a tiled path of some sort. But I really like the texture it gives us and it looks pretty cool. Also has a very nice fence. So um, later we're going to add a fence onto this uh, section and the fence I think looks really great. And uh, it's going to be a bit of a larger section. You can see it fits up, um, it takes up this whole area here that I've previously outlined with the, the perimeter path. And um, so we should have just about enough space for four, all four of the new Australian habitat animals plus two or three of the Southeast Asian animals. I believe we only have two or three. And uh, that should fill up this whole section quite nicely. Alongside I think we're going to introduce quite a few of the exhibit animals because we do have quite a few Australian exhibit animals. We do have the new blue tongue skink of course. But we also have things like um, one of the adders, you know, a couple other uh, insects or invertebrates. I believe we have the giant burrowing cockroach which is Australian as well. So we have a few different animals we can use. Here I've just started outlining the cassowary habitat and while I'm doing that let's actually take today, uh, take the time right now to talk about the cassowary as well and go into the species profile. So for those of you who are unaware or have newly subscribed, every time we do a Sanikov Land episode with a new animal we do a species profile on the animal where we learn a little bit more about it and that way we can just kind of you know get to know the animal a little bit more learn about its lifestyle its habitat its ecology as well as any threats it might face in the wild and how they're doing in captivity so i'm just going to quickly get the um the species profile of the cassowary up on screen now 
So the subspecies we are talking about, or the species uh, I should say, would be the southern cassowary. There are three cassowary species, the northern, the southern, and the dwarf cassowary, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and they're, they're pretty, pretty interesting animals, I do have to say myself. Like, you guys know I, I absolutely love cassowaries at this point. They are fascinating, fascinating animals that look really impressive. Like, as far as these birds go, they are pretty, pretty impressive. Like, for the size that they are, like, all other birds along the size are pretty kind of dull colored, like the emus and ostriches, but these guys definitely stand out. Now, thankfully, their IUCN status is least concerned. Unfortunately, their habitats are declining and their numbers are dropping slightly, but thankfully they remain at least concern. Um, I believe an Australian ecological body has said that they are uh, considered endangered to an extent because their habitat is being uh, kind of uh, lost at a relatively unfortunately fast rate. So definitely steps to conserve these guys are still necessary even though it's least concern. Uh, as far as the size goes, these guys are tied for the second or third heaviest bird with the emu. They can get up to 85 kilograms, uh, kilograms and 1.7 meters long and just about the same uh, in height as well. They inhabit tropical rainforests, really dense tropical rainforests. As far as mangroves and occasionally they will uh, venture out into scrubland and savanna type environments but generally they st stay in the deep forests. Their lifespan can get up to about 50 years, which is pretty impressive for a bird. And uh, the diet almost exclusively comprises of fruits, but they do eat seeds and occasionally small animals like lizards. Now let's get into some interesting facts about the cassowary, and let me tell you, these guys are fascinating. So like I said, they are the third or second largest bird, they kind of tie with the emu, though the emus generally speaking are probably a little bit bigger, a little bit heavier as well. The females, interesting enough, are much larger and more brightly coloured. So in birds, most of the time, for example, the uh, the most obvious example being the peafowl, the males are often the larger and more colourful ones, but with the cassowary, it is quite fascinating because the females are the larger ones, and they are also brightly coloured, like more brightly coloured than males, which I think is really, really cool. The uh, cask on top of their head, that little helmeted structure, that can be up to 7 inches tall, which is really interesting. It has a variety of functions. Um, the most commonly used is for them to kind of uh, use it to kind of push through the foliage of the rainforest because they tend to walk around with their heads kind of lower to the ground so they can push away foliage while looking for food. Um, they can also use them for display, of course, and occasionally use kind of like... They don't really... This is not like an intended use, but they have been seen kind of using it to butt against each other. But I, don't, I doubt that's like an intended use, that's just kind of, you know, you have it, might as well use it kind of thing. Um, the eggs are bright green, which is ridiculous, like, I, I swear, um, I'll get a picture up on the screen, but their eggs, if you were to stumble across them in a forest, you would think that they were a mango. Like, you'd flat out be like, oh look, there's some mangoes on the floor. They're a bit unripe, but they look like mangoes. They're genuinely bright green, they look like fruits, which is kind of crazy. Um, a theory why they're so brightly coloured is just so that the females can find them and uh, not lose them in the dense undergrowth. But um, yeah, it's absolutely bonkers how bright they are. And uh, one cool thing about these guys is you might know that they're also an extremely dangerous animal. They have an inner claw which can be up to 5 inches long and that claw is capable of seriously injuring any animal that it happens to be um, attacking. So. Definitely don't run into a cassowary. It has been known to um, attack when provoked, so don't provoke them. And uh, they can leave extremely bad injuries and even death on occasion. They have killed people in the past. Once again, never de uh, demonize an animal or an animal species because of human fatalities. That is absolutely not the point here. It's just to emphasize that these guys are um, very dangerous animals and should be uh, kind of respected and not provoked in any sort of way. They do uh, do pretty well in captivity, which I quite find interesting. I've seen quite a few in captivity. Recently I actually went to a petting zoo nearby and they had a cassowary. But as far as I can tell, most cassowary habitats in zoos and stuff like that aren't particularly impressive. They're usually given like a just a relatively generic paddock um, with some uh, foliage and not an awful lot of enrichment. So I thought let's do an, a slightly nicer one here today in Sunnycove land where they will get a lot more dense foliage, um, 
a little bit of a water pit as well to cool down in the heat. Um, some foraging pits. You know, just give them a bunch of nice enrichment. And you will have seen me do that all on screen in the past few minutes. As you can see, I'm, I'm really enjoying a lot of the new foliage, the new um, fan-leafed plant. I can't remember what they're called exactly. The Australian fan palm, that's what it is. They look really great as both a decorative element just outside the habitat as well as within the habitat itself. I uh, love including some rocks as well here and there. And I'm loving the new sapling plants. So you all have seen me put down the Brazil nut sapling. So these are just the small like young versions of the big plants we have in the game. And I think they look really great. They add this really nice vibe of like, oh, these plants have been newly planted here. You can tell that, you know, the zoo is putting in effort to bring in more foliage. And I really like that vibe. Otherwise, just a lot of other generic tropical foliage. I'm um, including the eucalyptus plants, the stringy wood, I believe it's called. Um, they're really cool. I love the new eucalyptus plants and they work really well in this tropical environment. Don't know how realistic it would be to have them in a zoo, like, which is probably not set in Australia, but I think they look great and uh, honestly, they just, yeah, they just look great. There's not much else to say. I think they, they really fit the habitat and I'll be using them more throughout the zoo as a whole so they don't look too like out of place just here. So I will be including some more eucalyptus throughout the park as we go along, just to give it a more interesting, uh, sorry not more, a more cohesive look. Now here I'm just doing the back wall of this habitat and I wanted it to kind of connect with um, the, the staff building. So there's going to be a staff building here and this staff building is going to be kind of responsible for most of the Australasian section and so I wanted it to be relatively long and wide and uh, this is just kind of the first facet of it. I will be building more uh, onto it in future episodes or between episodes even. So we'll see how that goes. I'm just using some of these new Australian logs to kind of decorate the outside. I'm not 100% sure how I feel about the uh, the look of that. So do let me know what you think in the comments down below. I, I do love the logs. I don't know. If, I just don't know if it, this um, design might be too kind of repetitive or too like... Uh, out there, I don't know. So let me know what you think in the comments. Now we're about halfway-ish through with the video. So let's talk a little bit about um, a couple of other things that are going on right now. So um, as you might know, we do have a Discord server for this channel and the link will be in the description. Uh, it would be amazing if you guys joined up. It's a lot of fun, you know, just to be able to chat to you guys and kind of have a space where you can learn a little bit more about the channel, have a little bit more of an inside look. Uh, if you want to chat to me, that's fine as well. And, you know, share your own Planet Zoo creations, talk about animals, dinosaurs, whatever you like. So it's a nice, fun place. And um, I've got four great uh, moderators there. We have uh, Jasper, we have Scooby, we have Leviathan, and we have Crocs. They're all great, great moderators. And they've done a really excellent job recently of setting up our first uh, community challenge. So that's going to be a challenge where you guys built something in Planet Zoo based around a specific theme and uh, you can upload that uh, to the Discord, I mean to the Steam Workshop but then post it on the Discord of course and then we'll kind of judge it and later on you'll get a little bit of a small size. We haven't decided what yet. Maybe, you know, like a shout out on the channel or maybe, you know, something like that. We'll, we'll figure out what the prizes are later. But it's not really about the, the whole prizes, it's just kind of more a fun way to get you guys building and get you guys a little bit more inspired perhaps to do a specific theme build. So it has been a lot of fun. These guys have uh, really done a great job, the moderators. They've done a really fantastic job setting this up. And uh, of course, I will link down their yeah, links to their respective uh, YouTube channels and Twitter down below. So uh, Scooby, I believe, has a Twitter. I think Jasper does as well. Uh, sorry, a YouTube channel and um, I believe Jasper does as well. Fox does have a Twitter. I'll put that down below. And um, yeah, feel free to check them out. Uh, of course, tell them I sent you, you know, just be for, uh, for the sake of it. But uh, they are all really, really excellent guys and their moderation has been brilliant. They've been really great like in the work they do for the Discord server because sometimes I can be a little bit absent because I've got a bunch of stuff going on in real life as well. So having them take care of the Discord and, you know, just do their thing and introduce things like these challenges have been really great. So yeah, so give them a like, go check out their pages or the YouTube channels. And of course, join the Discord server yourself if you want to participate in these challenges or even if you just want a place to hang out and, um, you know, chat, talk to us, share your own builds and maybe get some inspiration, you know, anything like that. So do you hope that uh, you guys will join up and I'll see you there.
don't forget, links in the description. Now back to the video itself. Uh, you may have just seen, I've just quickly finished up a little entrance to the staff uh, area. I'm loving the new Australian signs which are the little planks because they look quite nice. Here you are going to see me start working on the Australian gallery kind of shelter roof thing. So this is going to be a semi-open um, semi open shelter. I don't know how to really describe it. Basically it's a, it's not a building per se. It's kind of a building. I really don't know how to describe it. But basically it will be partially covered, partially uncovered. And uh, it's going to have these new carbon fiber pieces on the roof. And I love them. Those new carbon fiber pieces are so cool. I'm a very, very big fan of them. I think the texture is great. The underside of them with the kind of like crisscrossing um, pattern looks really excellent. Just overall, really big fan of this new, this new carbon fiber piece. I love that they snap into place as well so you can get some really cool shapes. So what I'm going to use is I'm going to use these plus the new wooden uh, architecture p uh, pieces. Which I really love as well, by the way. Those are really cool architectural pieces. The new you know, wooden walls, the new um, metal pieces, they're all really great. So I'm a big fan of that. And you can see I can just duplicate this across with the grid, of course, thanks to the wooden pieces. Just using the metal pieces as a little bit of support. And here's another thing I'm doing is uh, to alternate between the, um, the kind of textured side and the colorful side, I'm going to just alternate the the, um, the sides I'm using. So instead of the concave one, I'll use the convex one, etc. And they all snap into place and it looks really cool. And there we go. I'm starting to use the little Aboriginal artwork there, which is again really cool. I'm a big fan of the, um, the artwork. I just think it's such a cool um, addition to the zoo. And it's a really, I don't know, there's something so valuable about bringing in, you know, traditional artwork to to a game like this because you know as much as it is a game about the animals it is so vital to acknowledge the uh, the cultures in the regions where these animals come from because especially when it comes to native uh, native peoples and native uh, you know native um, individuals who have lived in those areas native cultures they are almost intrinsically tied to the the wildlife and the nature of those areas. For example, when it comes to this Aboriginal artwork, so much of it is um, directly influenced by the animals that surround them. And uh, it's just, ah man, it's, it's the, the effort that, that Frontier has put into this, it is so cool. It's just like, I am absolutely just so pleased with Frontier's decision to um, to really, I am literally kind of speechless sometimes because they've done such a good idea. They've worked with this indigenous artist named John Smith uh, Gumbula. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. He is the founder and chief of the indigenous creative of uh, Buran Holdings Australia, and he's recreated some of his own artwork for this uh, for this pack. And I believe those two that I've put on the right side of the screen right now are some of his. I believe uh, all the artwork actually is by him, so you can see his little signature at the bottom. Extremely cool. Like, I've gone on about this for a bit long, but genuinely it is something worth talking about. I am just really, really impressed that Frontier has gone to these lengths to bring this sort of, you know, uh, representation to the game. Because it is it's absolutely necessary, I think. Like, some of these um, issues in the real world like when it comes to animals and conservation and uh, protecting animals in the wild and stuff like that. Uh, and I've got some personal experience with this over the past year because <laughs> basically, let me explain the whole concept. Is that when you want to protect an animal in an area where there's already an indigenous population of people who have been living there for possibly thousands of years, those people need to be an integral part of your conservation efforts. So. One of the really cool things they've been doing in uh, the country I'm living in now, which is my, also my uh, birth country, Malaysia, is that um, they want to protect the Malayan tigers because the Malayan tiger is at risk of extinction. There's only about 200 left in the wild. But to do that, one of the best things they could do is work with the populations of people that have been living in those forests for hundreds 
uh, you know, just generations and generations because they know those uh, environments, they know those uh, those locations, they understand the ecology better than people who are you know just about to enter that area for the first time and because of that they will be able to more accurately help with conservation efforts they'll be able to do wildlife surveys better than anyone from outside the area they'll be able to access parts of the forest we probably didn't even know existed stuff like that and it just honestly really helps conservation efforts and at the same time when you bring in outsiders to talk about conservation you can at the same time um, improve the welfare of potential uh, potentially these cultures that are living in there by offering financial aid and stuff like that while at the same time you know bringing the idea of conservation to them and sustainable forest management and having them be the ones that do it because they understand it better than anyone and they have the autonomy to be able to manage something like that so it is a really cool thing and you can also start by like for example with uh, uh, rural communities like this within the forest. Sometimes bushmeat can be a bit of an issue because of course they need sources of food. But if you want to help with conservation, you can again bring in outside help for these individuals while at the same time giving them the, the kind of the resources and the ability to manage their wildlife. So again, uh, kind of conservation and uh, humanitarian efforts when it comes to kind of rural forested populations or indigenous peoples can go hand in hand because again these people have been linked to their environment to nature for such a long time and it is you know it is part of their world and they really have this intrinsic cultural link that will tremendously help when it comes to conservation efforts now I've gone on a little bit of a spiel there. I hope you guys understand what I mean though. Like that's just um, coming from me who's, uh, like I said, I had a little bit of experience with that this year because I did intern with a documentary filmmaking company and one of the pieces we did some work with, uh, work on was a piece about these uh, indigenous populations in central peninsula Malaysia and their work on kind of doing surveys for wild populations of tigers and stuff like that to learn a bit more about their populations. So yeah, I hope that was interesting for you guys. Definitely one of the topics I find quite fascinating and it is it's something worth thinking about when it comes to, you know, protecting wild populations or animals. Anyways, we are coming close to the end of the video. Again, I hope you found that interesting. You will just see me uh, replace the roof on the staff building. I think this flat roof uh, just looks a bit more modern. I did do a bit of a rusted roof earlier, but uh, it just didn't fit the Sanikov land vibe and I think this new flat roof does a lot more. Uh, the cassowary habitat is all in place now. The first section of the Australia Australasia Trail is complete. So with that all out of the way, just want to say to you guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, there will be another video on Saturday where we continue the Australia Trail with another Australian animal. The very small and very adorable member of this new pack of Australian animals that we have here. So do look forward to that. I think it's going to be super cute. And uh, yeah, I, I really hope you guys liked today's video. Once again, join the Discord server if you want to take part in some of our challenges and just have a place to hang out, talk about, you know, animal zoos, you know, share pictures of your own planet zoo builds. Of course, uh, learn a bit more behind the scenes of this channel. And uh, one more quick note is to just say that after next week, my upload schedule might become slightly inconsistent because I will be moving back to the UK for my final year of, uh, well not my final year, but another year of my university where I'm going to do a master's down in London. So while I do the big move over, things might be a tiny bit inconsistent. So do bear with me on that. But once I'm there, things should go back to normal somewhat and uh, fingers crossed, uh, things should be fine. And soon after that, I believe in October, I will be getting a new PC as well. So hopefully that will help with some of the content. I'm going to get one of the new RTX graphics cards from NVIDIA. Those look incredible. The launch was last night. I watched the live stream. Oh boy, I want one of those 3070 cards. They look incredible. So, you know, we'll, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, uh, thanks for watching, guys. Like the video if you did like the video. Comment down below. Let me know what you think of this video, of this whole concept that I was talking about earlier with um, indigenous peoples and conservation. And... Uh, yeah, if you like that, please do subscribe to the video, uh, subscribe to the video, subscribe to the channel, and, uh, wow.
Honestly, I made like 70 videos for over a year now, and I still don't know how to do outros, so yeah. <laughs> Thanks for watching guys, uh, and of course I'll see you in the next one. Bye!